David Weston joining us right now for our Wall Street Week daily segment. And he's sitting down right now with the chairman and CEO of Bank of America. For our Bloomberg television and radio watchers all around the world, we welcome now Brian Moynihan. He is the chair and CEO of Bank of America. So, Brian, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we just said you beat across the board. You surprised everybody across the board. Congratulations on that. But let me ask about what comes next, because I noticed that you gave a bit of guidance into 2024. Recently, you've been doing it quarter by quarter. Do you feel like you have a little more visibility in, uh, into the future than you have in the past? Yeah, yes, David, thank you. So the team did a great job this quarter, $7.8 billion earnings year to date, uh, $23 billion plus in earnings, a return on tangible common equity of 15% this quarter, uh, market share growth and a bunch of business organic growth around the company. But what gives us confidence to think of it? You're talking mostly about NII in terms of future guidance. If you think about it, where we see, we, we said we'd do 14.2 billion in the third quarter this year we did 14.5 billion we said we'd hold in at 14 billion for the fourth quarter and what we told people is as you look forward given the uh, the rate curve, the forward rate curve, what's going to happen rates, we see that 14 billion plus or minus bouncing along for a couple quarters and it's starting to grow from that. Why has that happened? We've seen you know, our deposit base in the, in the commercial businesses start to grow again after six quarters of basically being flat. We see it in the wealth management business for the last uh, few months basically running steady at about 300, 295 billion. And we see in the consumer business uh, a little spend down the accounts on some of the core side, but overall uh, outperforming the market, and that's a very valuable base with $500 billion of checking in it. So that says that $1.9 trillion of pods we have are good. The loans flat this quarter, but good growth on consumer, which frankly has uh, more yield to it. So we expect that. And as that comes together, we, we'd expect to see NII sort of pick up in the second half of the year. Um, and that coupled with the expense discipline we have uh, is a good path forward. Uh, Brian, talk about that deposit base, which is so important for net interest income. Uh, you added, I think it was like, like 200,000 new checking accounts and a million credit cards, a million one credit cards. Where are those coming from? Are you taking uh, market share from someplace or just more people coming to the market? How, where are they coming from? Well, we, we do really well with young, uh, the, the consumer business and the American business, but we do really well with young Americans. And so we keep adding uh, a higher percentage of accounts uh, for young people. And so it just, it comes from America. And so it is a taking market share. These are primary checking accounts in the household, 92% plus average balance, about you know 10,000 uh, in them. Uh, so it's a very strong checking base. And that, that account growth of 900,000 for the last four quarters, a million uh, in the four quarters before that those numbers are net growing to 37 million Americans use our company for their core consumer checking business and that's a great but a great group of customers high customer satisfaction high employee satisfaction in that area and it all works and it produces a 980 billion dollars of deposits in consumer Brian in the past you've talked about the non interest bearing accounts the deposits you have that you don't have to really pay interest on I wonder about that you seem to be doing a bit better than maybe your competitions does do you have some pressure because as you see those rates go up you must have some people at least on the margin saying you know what I can get some interest someplace. And they did, and that's why our deposits have moved down. You know, so if you think about our wealth management business, they probably peaked at uh, 50, 60 billion higher, and a lot of that money moved to the market. And I heard in your last segment, you know, our uh, customers at Merrill Lynch are holding the highest amount of cash and treasuries and things that they've held up three or four hundred billion dollars over the last couple of years and that money is waiting to come back in the market when things stabilize so and that business happened in the commercial business you saw that go out and then you saw it build back and that's starting to grow again at the 500 billion dollar left in the consumer the higher the consumers that have investment cash cash that they don't need to conduct their day-to-day -day operations they have moved that into the into the higher yielding savings accounts or even in the market and so if you look at the upper uh, levels of deposit, average deposit balances in you know, 50,000, 60,000 and above, those are actually down from the pand pre-pandemic. And the reason why is that money went in the market. It didn't disappear. They just moved it to other things. The core transaction base is coming in and out. The paycheck comes in every two weeks or every week or every month. It goes through, pays all the bills, and then comes in again. That That is really hard to position because my position and my bills go through and I don't have the cash in the account. So it's a different business and it's a business which we do for companies and wealthy people and consumers, but it's a big consumer business for us and it continues to grow and grow well. So, so Brian, you have such a vantage point into the consumers across the country and you said that, that you're starting to see that slow some as we go into the end of the year. Do you have any expectations through the end of the year into 2024? Will it continue to slow? So let's think about 
two or three things there. One is just what are the consumers doing with the money they have in their accounts? And in a given year, uh, we ha will have $4 trillion that will be spent by our consumers on debit card, credit card purchases, Zelle payments, uh, checks written, money out of the ATMs, and all the different forms they spend it. Uh, that $4 trillion from in 21 to 22 grew at 9%. Year to date for the first four or five months of the year, I would have been telling you in the second quarter, it's still growing strong at like 8%. It's now down to 4 to 5% in the year to date and about 4 4.5% in the month of September and in the month of October consistent with that. The consumer has been slowing down their spending because interest rates take a toll because as rates went up on their floating rate loans or home equity loans or other things that float credit cards or frankly new car purchases the rates are higher though there are mortgages getting done those rates are higher that slows down their the restart of student loans all those slow down their ability to spend on other things they have to shift spending around and on top of that frankly they're they're looking ahead say hey i hear things are going to be bouncing around a little bit i'll spend a little less and then the third thing is they take, you know, they bought the, the goods they bought during COVID. They bought the, you know, the new couch and stuff. They don't need to buy another one now. They've taken the trips, and now they're back into their core activity. And so as you put all that together, it's slowed by half. And what is spending rate at uh, the year-over-year -year growth is consistent with 2% inflation and below 2% GDP growth. It is the same, that rate of 4% or so is what we had in 17, 18, and 19 as the economy kind of ended, ended into an equilibrium. So frankly, the Fed has won the battle with the American consumer and, just, and they're slowing down. And then the question is, what happens next, I can't predict, but this, this is a $4 trillion base, three to $400 billion a month. So think about it, it's hard to move around a lot. So once it slows this level, it's probably not gonna kick right back up. So, Brian, how much of a vantage point do you have into where the, the consumer, the household stands? Because there was a lot of talk about essentially excess savings come out of the pandemic because a lot of the checks that were being written to individuals and the dry powder, if you will, and drawing down on that. Do you have a sense of how much has been drawn down on it? And a second question is, to what extent is real wage increase maybe replacing some of that? Well, that's that's the thing. So if you look, look, inflation's tough, especially on median income households uh, in terms of goods and services are higher part of what, goods are a harder part of what they buy. Groceries are a bigger number, gas prices are a bigger number, and it's very difficult. And that's what the pressure you see in some of the consumer sentiment. It, that's one issue. But if you look at it in a broad aggregate sense, what you see with this kind of spending rate is a consumer that's healthy. If you look in the accounts, uh, especially in accounts, median income, 75,000 and under, av that had average balances before the pandemic, there's still multiples, but they're trickling down. And so the rumors that they were going to be spent down by this Christmas of 22 is what people were saying last year. They're going to be overspent. Didn't happen. And it was going to happen by early this year, didn't happen. When it was gonna happen by the fall this year, didn't happen. And now it's starting to happen slowly. And it, but at, that, at this rate, it'll still be many more months. The thing about that is, you pointed out, is for the first couple of years after the pandemic, the wages rose quickly and then inflation caught up. And if you look at multi-years, it's more in sync. Recently, it's upside down and the wage growth has slowed down as employers have been more conservative and, and the, the great resignation has gone out of the system. So you're kind of at an equilibrium across multiple years. Right now, you feel more upside down. And then by income strat, it's a little different. And that will then slow the consumer down. That's what we're seeing. From what you've seen, are you anticipating more delinquencies or defaults as we get into 2024 on the consumer side? We, we, we have seen the, you know, the early stage delinquencies in consumer are, are below where they were in 19. And the problem with saying that is we say they're normalized in 19, everything's, oh my gosh. The reality is 2019, I think, was like a 40-year low in delinquencies and charge-offs in our company's history. So we're, we're normalizing to a level that is very low. The consumer is still very strong. The delinquency and charge-off rates in the card business, in the, you know, in, in the mortgage business, we have no charge-offs. Home equity have recoveries. It's, you know, the auto business, we're a prime lender. We have a, billion, a trillion dollars of loans, and we continue to drive that growth. But we've always been a prime lender to the consumer side. That's half our portfolio. And on the commercial side, we're a very good commercial lender. So whether it's, you know, wherever it is, the consumer is in very good shape in terms of because they're employed and earning money. And so our delinquencies are normalizing because out of the pandemic, they went really low, and there was all the special programs and student loan deferrals and all, the, all that went on. They're normalized, but they're normalizing to a place that's still very low. And so the charge-offs continue to come up a little bit, but to a number that we used to charge off every quarter and nobody asked about, thinking it was great results. 
Brian, we've been talking about the consumer and uh, deposits. Let's talk about the global markets business that you have because you also had some very uh, reassuring, encouraging numbers on things like trading, on things like investment banking. A few years ago, you and I talked and you expressed some dissatisfaction, thinking that you needed to do more in that area, maybe grow your balance sheet, some take some risks. Where are you in that process? Is there more still to come for Bank of America in investing in that business? Well, my, uh, our former colleague, Tom Montag, you know, four or five years ago said, we need to grow this business. We got it in great shape. Let's do it. He's retired. Jimmy DeMar took over the business and started running it a few years, three or four years ago. And he's basically taken that investment strategy and delivered on it. And so they had one of the best quarters they've had. Um, they consistently up about 25 percent, you know, versus pre-pandemic years average. Um, they're doing it the right way, made money every trading day, uh, a lot more stable revenues and financing and things like that that help it. The equities business at a, at a at 1.6 billion, you know, for a long time it was a billion, billion one, billion two, and now it's fundamentally moved to a different level. Good performance on the fixed income business, rounding out the capabilities. So Jim and the team have done a great job, and they delivered, and they keep, you know, working themselves up the ladder in market share, uh, you know, quarter after quarter after quarter, because this business is not easy, and mm -hmm. a lot of people are quitting it, a lot of people are reshaping it. But for those of us that have this worldwide platform that's well managed, it is a ch chance to continue to grow, and we'll continue to dedicate resources to. It. Well, on that, on the investment banking side. On, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, David. On the investment banking side, because you mentioned that, Matthew Coder runs that business for us. And we were basically flattish in the market that was down 20%. Two or three reasons. That. One is the team's doing a great job of serving the clients well. But secondly, we're playing off our advantages, whether it's what we call EGRC, middle, think middle market investment banking, or whether it's some of our industry groups that are just doing a great job. You know, Matthew's been able to hold share, even though the market's down, and the pipeline is full. And we, you know, we think that you could see the transaction just before I got on. There was another transaction, Ruben, in the market that I heard your colleague speaking mm -hmm. about. So activity is starting to take place. Um, it is not where it was, you know, uh, before the market started, the rate started rising and stuff. But if it gets anywhere back that, you'll see us go from this $1.1 billion level quickly up to 1.5, 1 1.6, 1 and then we'll see where it goes from there. And the team does a good job. But importantly in that business, remember we have corporate uh, lending and GTS, or Global Transaction Service, cash management, so-called. And its revenues were up 15, 20% year over year, and it's, it just drove the profit of the business, the pre-tax, pre-provision profit. So, Brian, you took us exactly where we wanted to go, which was investment banking, particularly middle market, because you said that that's an area you think you can continue to grow. And I wonder, as you look to possibly grow that, maybe invest, is part of that looking for middle level and senior people that you might bring in as laterals, I would call them? Uh, we will do that, but frankly, it, what we did is we, uh, we took, Matthew took about 100 people, around 90, 100 people out of the industry-led investment banking into the middle market, mm -hmm. and the team has done a great job over there. So he might get them over there, and I said earlier, that's like, say, 190, 200. I said they could go to 400. There's a lot of uh, capacity to grow there, and Wendy Stewart, who has that middle market client base of tens of thousands of customers, and Raul and I has the 50 million under revenue companies, they have a lot of capacity to use. And just this quarter, we had a $50 million increase among that middle market customer base increase. And it'll be 25, 30% of all the investment banking revenues uh, in, in, in the business. It, it, and so it's, it's a very strong area for us, but we can grow without, we'll hire people on the outside if we need them, but the reality is, and we always do that, but the reality is we have a lot of teammates we can redeploy as some, certain areas are slow, we redeployed those teammates to areas that we knew we could grow. And by the way, it's a major investment business to do that. We have not done layoffs and things like that in our company generally and not investment bank. And we just have repositioned the people and sent them after clients that we think we can be successful with. Uh, Brian, one of the changes that looks like it's coming to your business is increased to reserve requirements. Uh, there's a proposal out there, comments coming in. Uh, and I wonder what your views on that. And specifically, assuming they go through in something like the form we're seeing right now, how much would it change your business, how you do your banking? Well. So let's start a couple things. One is the rules uh, were proposed. There's a comment period at close end in November. Um, and you've seen in the market and you've seen in the press, the, you know, obviously the industry's got a lot of comments coming, our trade associations, our individual companies, a lot of things we think should be changed for the good of the American economy. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is the American banking system has tremendous capital and capabilities, as you see in the stress test and all the way we've, we've tested that in the real world and the stress world. And our company fares better in a stress <laughs> test than the, than the peers do. So that's, that's the backdrop. What it really means, though, if you take the rules as proposed today without any modification and or uh, what we call optimization, our risk-weighted assets today are $1.63 trillion. 
you'd have about an increase of 20% to $1.95 trillion. Interestingly enough, at the end of the third quarter, our CET1, our Common Equity Tier 1 capital, what counts as the numerator in this case, is $194 billion. And our requirement beginning next January is 10%. So 10% times $1.95 trillion is $195 billion. So we actually have the capital in the company, number one. Number two, we're actually earning a 15% return on, return on tangible common equity on that capital today. So we would have to build a little buffer of maybe $10 billion more. But, but frankly, the, the team does a great job of the capital. Is, is this capital needed? I would say it wasn't needed yesterday. I don't know why it's needed tomorrow. Uh, do we have time to phase into it? Yes, if the rules get adopted, it'll be a three-year phase in, in the current rule. Maybe we'll see what comes out of it. Will it be changed? I hope so. Uh, but the reality is, from a Bank of America perspective, it's not like we need to retain extra capital or do other things to get there because we have the capital in the company today to the great work of the team. If something goes through like what we've seen so far, understanding it may be modified through the comment period, uh, would it affect your competitiveness? And if so, with whom? Is it with banks from overseas? Is it with, with non-banks? How might it hinder your competitiveness in the marketplace? So it, they're, they're all of the above, but let's, let's think about that. It, it, that in the U.S., or relative to European banks and others, if you look at a bank our size in Europe, you look at the largest bank in all the countries, they have what we call an RWA intensity, i.e. the RWA uh, uh, risk-weighted assets percentage of the total assets is about half ours. And so for half the capital, they get a higher capital ratio. That seems counterintuitive because they do the same business as we do, as our company does, especially with middle market lending, consumer banking, wealth management, and capital markets and large corporate banking. So that seems odd. That means it's, it's uncompetitive for the banks. Well, people say, well, do we really care about that? You know, so what? We have more capital. That means we're safe and sound. What that really means, though, is a mid-sized company in Europe who is a supplier of the auto businesses in Europe and, and will be able to supply in Europe and around the world with a lower cost of borrowing because you can make the same return on half the capital by charging less interest. If you come over to the U.S., you know, say you have two companies making bumpers for cars, you're going to find out that the cost of borrowing in the U.S. is higher. That means the cars, uh, that middle market company that supplies that materials may not be as competitive. That's what we've got to be careful of. So a lot of people, when we say it isn't competitive, think it's about, you know, ourselves or our, my peers and you know, the other big banks. No, this is about the ability to lend downstream, and that's what we're saying is a competitive risk. Then you take the point you made about us vis-a-vis -vis the non-bank. Half of all the asset classes that banks lend against, mortgages, credit cards, commercial, are outside the banking system. And so if you keep raising capital requirements, what you do is you push the activity out. And as you push that activity out, you can't regulate it and see it. So you know, while people are worried about commercial real estate, what you're hearing, reading a lot about lender, lenders, quote, taking back the keys, are not in the banking system. They're outside the banking system because that business is half outside the banking system. That's not altogether good. Uh, it's not a bad thing to be able to distribute that risk. We's all, we've always done it. But you've got to be careful about it. If it goes too far, then you have unregulated participants uh, outside the industry carrying on a lot of activity. And if it doesn't, isn't handled right, it impacts the broader economy and you can't touch it. So that's a second way to think about competitiveness. Uh, Brian, I'm mindful that you've, you've been there 10 years now running Bank of America. Uh, and you've always been had as a hallmark responsible growth. Uh, explain the growth from here on out from your point of view. Where does that come from? Where do you devote resources, maybe take some resources away from some other part of the organization to drive the next phase of growth for Bank of America? Look, at the end of the day, uh, it, it's been 14 years, David. Time flies and we're having fun. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, we started the responsible growth about a decade ago, and that was about making sure after the financial crisis and all the retooling had to be done that we focused on growth. And responsible growth means you've got to grow no excuses. You've got to do it the right way with risk, client focus, and you've got to be sustainable. It's got to be growth that can stick to the ribs. That's what we do. And so as we look forward, the growth's going to come from more clients and more done with each client. So this today, if you, in our earnings materials, we talked about 11,000 uh, 11, new net new clients in the wealth management business, or 1,100 new commercial clients, more than we did all last year. Or we, we talk about the, the 10,000 referrals that went out of the private bank to other parts of the company. It, all these different statistics are all about driving that. Now, where do we have great opportunity? Think about our merchant business. We bought the 
piece in a few years ago, took a charge to bring it in, restructured the business, and now we're out selling. The sales are up 20%. Think about our 401k and other re retirement businesses. We're number six in a business. We can grow that. Think about our G GTS cash manager business, just infinitely scalable across the globe. A lot to do internationally on that. We, we do a lot already. We can do more. Um, and then think, you know, so if you think about all these different products, we have places we're number six. In the core businesses, we're one, two, three. That doesn't mean they can't grow. That means if you look at our consumer business, which is the largest retail uh, consumer business in the country, it's still growing year over year. 10% more investment accounts, another million uh, checking accounts, which is 3% growth in a big, huge book. And that, that, that just plays and comes right across where we have less branches, less people, less technology, but very valuable teammates when customers need that source, but we use that digital to drive it. And so we have lots of room for growth in every area. Even that middle market investment bank I talked about earlier, again, 25, 30% of the activity could be 50, 60% of the activity and help us grow. We, we can see the clients, we can see what we can do, and we just got to get after it. Uh, Brian, finally, a couple of broader questions here. We're all mindful of what's going on right now in the Middle East with Israel and Hamas, and that's after Ukraine. There was a lot of geopolitical conflict around the world. Does that affect your business at Bank of America? How do you internalize that? How do you uh, adjust to that, if at all? Well, we. Uh, we have teammates in Israel. We had an office, and the teammates talked to us on the phone today to a group of senior leaders. Um, and so the first thing we do is have to make sure our teammates are safe. And, and more broadly across our 200,000 teammates, other teammates have relatives uh, and, and family that were, that were hurt in the initial attack. And, you know, so it's a tough situation, but that's where we always go first. Stabilize, make sure our teammates are getting all the support they can have. Then we do work with humanitarian organizations to provide broader relief. But if you think about it more from the volatility in the markets and more from the outcome, it, you know, look, you've got, you know, wars on two places going now. And these are all, this adds the volatility and adds the movement in the markets and adds the day-to-day -day movement. But at the end of the day, these are you know, huge human crises going on that we, you know, we, we hope solve. Uh, we aren't sure they will, but we have to run the company, given that we got to be ready for anything that comes at us. And geopolitical risk is a major risk for the company faces on a given day. And as you say so correctly, it's first and foremost a humanitarian tragedy, really, a, a horror going on. Uh, this is not so much a humanitarian tragedy, but what's going on in Washington right now? Same question. Is it affecting you? Because we're looking at the prospect of possibly a government shutdown again in November, and they seem to have some dysfunction. And that's a Political issue. That's not your job. But could it affect the economy? Could it affect Bank of America? Look, the government running smoothly is sort of an assumed outcome, um, you know, in the United States. And anything that gets in the way of that is not a, is not a good thing. And so the ebbs and flows of uh, the needs for funding and operations shutting down or threatening to shutting down. No, that's good. And everybody knows that. And that's why they keep trying to figure out ways to move it down the road and have the political argument they want to have about the policies embedded in those budgets, which are, you know, that's what, they, that's what they're there for. They're supposed to have those arguments. But you want the rest of the bank, the rest of the operations. You've got millions of federal employees are affected by it. So we approach the, a government shutdown, the many that have occurred over time that we've been around, because we've been around since 1784, so this is not a new concept for us. But we've approached it the same way we approach any other disaster. First, the employees of the government, we waive fees and payments and everything to make sure they're fine. And then we basically then try to work to ensure that we have the risk covered. We have to worry about, you know, impact on markets. And so we analyze that, we get ready for it, and we have teams that are ready to go at any given moment. Um, it's, you know, anything that's Anything that has the United States not be the most stable place on earth is just not a good thing. Um, and so, yeah, but you have to divorce the real political process away from the operations, which we just need the government to be paying its bills and functioning, and they can have the argument over size of budgets and everything. That's what, that's what they're supposed to do, but we need to make sure that we don't have an accident on the other side, and that's the thing we've got to be careful of. Well, when you mention stability, I really am mindful of what's been going on with actually yields in the bond market, which has been pretty volatile recently for all sorts of the reasons that you identified, actually, including geopolitical. Is that something that we should be concerned about, the degree of volatility in the bond market? You know, it's, you've had guests talking about it in a day-to-day. -day. It moves, you know, if you don't like it today, look tomorrow <laughs> as, the, as like the statement about the New England weather because, the, you know, it was 480, almost 5, then down to 460, and then back up to 480 and up today. So it bounces around. But that's just the ebb and flows of people in the market trying to figure out, you know, the day-to-day -day trading. Longer term, you know, the Fed is going to hold rates higher for longer. What our team, Candace Browning Platt and the team with the great research team, believe that the cuts they have in their models are 
th two next, th two or three next year, and four the year after. So that's 175 basis points off of the level it is now, still above four. That is higher for longer, and that's what the market's adjusting for. You're going to have a real rate curve, and we, anybody that's under the age of 40 something, wasn't around <laughs> pre global financial crisis when the rate structure was higher. A three percent Fed's funds rate is more normal than what we went through from 2010 till uh, uh, till 19, and it never got up to that level. And in fact, at the end of 19, if you remember, the Fed started cutting rates to push the economy. So they're mindful of the impact. But the idea is to have you know, inflation at target as opposed to longing for it, which is what many Fed governors had, or many Fed uh, chairs had to do, and many central bankers on the world, they kept saying, oh, if only we had inflation. You know, now you have it. Now you've got to manage it down. But you've got to be careful you don't overshoot. And that's the challenge. So the rates will reflect the geopolitical, it'll reflect their view of the rate curve. They're clear right. about where they're going. I think they're more done than not. Everybody thinks that. Right. But even when they talk about higher for longer, it means a rate curve coming down to right. support the normalization of growth. And that's right. consumer spending we see. Right. That says maybe this is coming down faster than they think.